Whispering podcast explores the multisensory pathways to connect with the other world, such as listening to messages in owl's hoots, singing to mermaids in a moonlit cove, or knowing what to give a gnome when they come to dinner. I'm Claire Kaisley, a fairy whisperer and researcher. Take my hand and I'll guide you safely through the enchanted twilight woodland where they are waiting to meet you. If you enjoy this episode and would like to support the show, you can sign up to my Fairy Whisperer patron community or make a one-off donation via Buy Me A Coffee. You can also follow me on Twitter at Fairy Whispering. I also have a YouTube channel, Fairy Whisperer. I hope to see you in one of these places. See links in the notes for the show. Hello to my listeners, wherever you are in the world. I have some exciting news for you. Season 2 begins on Wednesday the 30th of August with my guest Karen Kay, who is a best-selling Hay House author, fairy and mermaid whisperer and creator of Fairy Fairs and Three Wishes Fairy Festival here in the UK. On Wednesday the 6th of September... I speak with Jeremy Garner, who is an author, musician, teacher and traveller in the fairy realms. Karen and Jeremy, for me, embody the energies of the Queen and King of Fairy. These are two wonderful shares and I feel really excited and honoured to have them leading the way into season two of Fairy Whispering. Do you hope you'll join me next Wednesday to celebrate the start of season two. For my patrons, I have an extra special treat. I'll be sharing excerpts from my Fairy Whisperer journals, which contain my fairy experiences from the last seven or eight years. It includes some fairy wisdom and fairy encounters. Thank you to all of my patrons for their continued support. You can join our Fairy Whisperer patron community for bonus content and extended show notes. Plus, there's a Discord community. You can also buy me a coffee. My Fairy Whisperer YouTube channel contains video versions of these episodes and other videos about fairies and how to work with them. On to the episode, which is an updated edit of one that I aired in summer 2022 for my Weird Wonderful Wonders podcast. My guest this time is folklore researcher and colleague in the world of fairy, Jo Hickey Hall. Jo has a wonderful project and podcast called Modern Fairy Sightings, which records real fairy experiences. Jo co-authored a chapter with fellow researcher Mark Norman about pixies and rocks on Dartmoor for the book Magical Folk by Dr Simon Young. I believe all adventures should begin with tea, so we started at a cafe in Widdicombe and then went for a wander on the hillside above the village. I wanted to start here because there is a folklore record of a pixie sighting in a field near Widdicombe and this area has many small enclosures. It was a beautiful sunny day on the approach to Beltane and we had stunning views of Widdicombe village and hills and tours around us. We then continued our walk and talk at Emsworthy Nature Reserve where we explored the farm ruins. It was here that we discussed the unusual encounter that we had whilst relaxing on a rock above Widdicombe. Jo also shares her connection to fairy through her father's stories and his Irish ancestry which is really a really beautiful share. 
I talk about my grandfather who inspired my interest to the supernatural. I always think about him when I go up to Dartmoor. Whilst editing this part of our chat at Emsworthy, to my surprise and delight, I found what sounds like a woman singing a wordless song in the background. This is known as an EVP, electronic voice phenomena. These are believed by paranormal researchers to be spirit voices. Apologies for the sound quality in some parts of the recording. This was due to windy conditions which were out of my control. Thank you for understanding. As a bonus for my patrons, there is a video about my creative process for making mirror photos. These are images that I create symmetrical designs from in a mindful way. The imagery reveals beings, patterns and symbols which are amazing and enchanting. You can also access the audio recording and video of what happened when I returned to Emsworthy after my time with Joe, and I attempted to contact the resident spirits. Having followed my own fairy path for many years, it was a real joy to discuss fairy experiences with Joe and the importance of protecting our wild places in nature. Enjoy, and I will come back to you at the end with some closing thoughts. farm worker that's walking through the field and he walks past a granite stone like a boulder mm. and hears the oven's hot and then he answers back bake me a cake then mm. and then by the time he's walked to the end of the field he finds you know a, a cake there laid laid for him yeah that's just come out of the oven <laughs> don't know if that's one of the ones that the Devonshire Association picked up. So there's that great connection with stones on the landscape. Mm. And when you look at this field, look, in these fields on Dartmoor, there's loads of stones always. Mm. And so, you know, it's very true that anyone ploughing a field like that would have to walk around the stone in the middle. Mm. <laughs> Um, there's so many fields across Dartmoor with those big stones in the middle. Oh, keeping up with mummy. Oh, oh. darling. Oh. Yeah, I was thinking as you were you know, mentioning the fact that you brought me to Woodacombe in the moor because of the the sighting with the pixies emerging from the bracken, so that mm. might be something fun to, to yeah. go and just come, go and have a little wander, find somewhere that we feel is suitable, and have a little meditation. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, that sounds. That sounds let's do that. Joe and I found a lovely place to rest and to meditate by a small tinkling stream. Joe came up to Dartmoor a few years ago to put some posters up. We were just talking about that, so perhaps Joe, you can talk a bit more about what you do. Yeah, and so oh, it's nice that we're sort of standing here up on the hill and you pointed out where the Prince Town Masters and um, over there in the distance mm. from this idyllic spot that we're on next to a little stream that's coming down here and beautiful boulders strewn everywhere it's gorgeous so in the distance as we're looking over to Prince Town yeah that reminded me about um, sort of what initially kicked off the modern fairy sightings project was that um, during my masters with Ronald Hutton at the University of Bristol I joined the Folklore Society and I joined um, a subgroup of that which was the newer researchers group and I went along and um, I met Mark Norman who at the time had been asked to write a chapter f 
for Simon Young's book, Magical Folk. And um, Mark and I teamed up to write that chapter. And it was about Devon. So Magical Folk was um, fairies in the British Isles and Ireland. That was 2016. Well, it was actually published in 2016. I think it must have been 2015 when we came down to Devon and we um, visited Princetown. We went for a lovely drive all around, visited Jay's grave um, and not Haytor, but Houndtor. Houndtor. Mm-hmm. And then we went up to Princeton with these posters that I thought what would be a good idea is if we put it out there that we wanted to hear from people. So it's not only we'll be doing a kind of literature research of all of the of the fairy sightings and folklore connected with Devon. But um, I wanted to hear about modern accounts mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. So we um, we put these up in the pubs up around there with my number, which was a mobile I had specifically for people to call me on. It was called the fairy phone. <laughs> That's and, <wonderful. laughs> yeah. and then this poster of a man, a fairy man, and it was it was an image that my husband had drawn mm. from my own description of the green man that I saw. Mm. Mm. And that has subsequently become the logo for the project itself and the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast. Sorry. Mm. Yeah, the Modern Fairy Sightings Facebook group as well. Mm. Um, yeah, so this is kind of where it all began, really. Oh, isn't it amazing to be here looking at this view uh, a few years later yeah so that's like about that. six or seven years that's crazy i mean obviously yeah. the last couple of years time i don't know what time is doing the last couple of years because yeah it's just flying at the mm. moment and it's not making any sense mm. um but it's crazy then that that is probably nearly seven years ago mm. and just to say before we move on the the man that your husband drew mm. that you saw you you've got an episode about that haven't you or you yeah did you speak about I it did I spoke did about you... it publicly it took me a long time to do that I think mm. it was something that I was happy to tell people that I was speaking to privately um you know we would exchange stories with each other of what we had seen and you know that's really what the podcast is all about really it's it's and the project itself it's allowing people a space to share their experiences and be heard and also to connect with others um Mm. who have had experiences so it was i i've always been open about what i experienced myself but i hadn't put it out to a general public before Mm. um until i made that decision um gosh I'm thinking again I think it must have been 2021 it must have been early last year that I put Mm -hmm. that episode out and that is on the modern fairy sightings podcast and it I think it's just called something like Joe's fairy experience um and I'm glad I did I think Mm -hmm. it was the right time I felt ready to I've had other encounters that I haven't spoken about publicly but that encounter was just so it was unlike anything else I've ever experienced. I wasn't, I didn't have my eyes closed in meditation or anything like that mm. at the time. They were wide mm. open and as you'll hear if you listen to it, you know, I was just somewhere with my husband and turned around and came face to face with this little man. And, you know, and it it talks so, it, it's so similar to a lot of the old folklore that we hear, mm. Devon included, where people will be out I'm thinking of the the quite shocking one actually it's probably not the best example but in terms of you know um how we view fairies but the one where I think it's Veronica Maxwell or I think her name's Veronica I can't remember her surname she's sitting on a log yes 
and this pixie comes along running along the log and slaps yeah. her face which is really yeah. shocking but I suppose the point I'm making is that people will be out in nature minding their own business and they will see mm-hmm. a fairy mm-hmm. or like the other one with the, the pixie gambling mm-hmm. along and you know just like we're doing today it was a woman and her husband out walking in Devon and they saw yeah. you know they saw something and 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 do you think from what you've learned so far about people's experience and your own experiences that it tends to be people that aren't expecting to see something or maybe maybe they've never wanted to see anything like that or a bit skeptical but maybe that going out with that you know a bit more of a raise expectation means that you're less likely to be open to be taken by surprise yeah definitely i think that when you are going out with an intention and an expectation you are coming from you know a place where you you sort of want to control the environment around you and to some degree you want something to happen you you are placing yourself somewhere rather than just going to where you love doing something that you love appreciating nature and just allowing the flow I think there's Mm. something about just that that flow of being in the moment Um, and maybe it could be about who you're with maybe it could be about your thoughts at the time but I guess it's just being open but not in a way that you know you're looking for something in particular because I think that then sort of yeah. it sort of changes the vibe. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I believe that you can set an intention. I think intention's really powerful, mm. isn't it? To sort of set an intention of I'm going to go out into this place, honour the place in whatever way and be open to an experience but it's yeah. that it's not the grasping is it it's yeah. not the well, I'm going to have an experience yeah. it's, it's just letting it come in whatever form yeah. needs to come isn't it yeah I think it's just being mm. in a place of peace maybe I don't know because when, mm. when I was when the, the time that it happened to me I was not thinking about fairies whatsoever um I didn't think it was possible even though I was into other stuff you know and was quite into into quite spiritual things like seeing auras and you know interested in crystals and even astral projection and things like that not that I was practicing it but I was interested um and healing and things but um yeah when you you know I was just presented with this encounter face to face and and really it changed everything um i suppose if i look back now you know that's where the following steps of the journey came from really because mm. it, you know i then joined a um, um a group of people that were practicing earth magic folk magic you know ritual magic where i lived and went deeper it definitely drew me in deeper mm. and then I'm working with intention and then we're working with ritual and then we're having other experiences but nothing like seeing this being that was just like any other person it, it looked like they were just in the flesh there you know mm. I was looking right at him so whereas I've had other experiences where I've been in um, a slightly altered state uh, or a ritual state or meditative state and I've I've had other kinds of encounters nothing like that that first one I mean I I mm. really believe that these you know even really difficult experiences can really crack us open can't it yeah. and sort of lay us quite vulnerable to mm. to all things but um, was this I mean definitely you don't have to talk about it it's too personal but is, was there something that happened before that that 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think that year, um, well, it was probably the, the, the previous year, my life had completely changed. I had, as I said, I'd been interested in healing. I'd gone for a healing. Um, I'd gone to learn a new system of healing called Body Mirror System. And while I was there, I had a healing from the person that created Body Mirror System. It was Martin Brofman. And um, and I was not the same afterwards. It was like mm -hmm. he turned on a switch. It was like he turned the on switch. Mm hmm and when I opened my eyes after that, I could see clearly. I mean, my vision was, <laughs> I didn't need to wear my glasses anymore. Um, and I had that whole experience. So life was very different. I went back to my life and, you know, everything changed. My whole group of friends changed. Um, I think even my job changed at the time where I was living changed my home I got a, a home that I'd been really waiting for for a long long time and suddenly when I got home I had a letter to say that I was being offered this house wow. and that we could go and see it that week and we did yeah. and then we moved in a couple of weeks later so literally just everything shifted after that first healing and um and then as a result of being with these new friends I was going different to different places and, and I met my husband in mm -hmm. London mm -hmm. And, you know, he came to live with us in Jersey. And um, so, yeah, where, by the time I had had that encounter, my, my husband and I were dating. He hadn't yet moved to Jersey. It was still fairly soon in the relationship. It was about six months in. And, um, you know, we were in that moment where you know you're so in love and you know that yes. this is your soulmate. You uh -huh. just know. Um, and that's when it happened. But I think I was I was kind of on that point where, yeah, you know, we were we were building a, a life together, even it, it kind of subconsciously, and and even though it hadn't sort of been realised yet. I believe that energy, love energy, really attracts otherworldly yeah. beings. Uh, mm. is, is that what you feel that they, he was Definitely. attracted to you and your partner I of do that? I do yeah. and I think also there was a lot of passion and I think that the pixies you know names they're a bit naughty I think <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it was it was it was deep love and deep attraction um, mm. so I do I do think that uh that definitely had some kind of pull on me yeah on the situation yeah yeah because there i mean there's all this uh, we're coming up to it, aren't we beltane a mm. time of year when traditionally um i think in most parts of the country but definitely down here people you know couples will go off and make hay mm. in the fields or in the woods and yeah. You know, and the fairies are very connected to that whole fiery, passionate vibe, aren't they? Sure. That whole process, yeah. yeah, and mm -hmm. I'm a Taurian as well, so that time of year is always very. You know, that's my favorite. This is my favorite time of year. Yeah. It's coming up to my birthday. Um, yeah, I love that about the land. Everything is bursting through with, you know, mm. passion and blooming, and yeah, it makes me think of. You know the Empress in the tarot, who really kind of ah. resonate with that energy. Yeah. What does she symbolise? I mean, I know about well, just for people. So. Yeah, I guess kind of there's a bountifulness there, a blooming, a giving, vibrancy. Uh, when I think of um, the Empress, you know, she's surrounded by beautiful flowers and everything's in full bloom and it's it's potent as well there's a potency to that and I think you know that's also interconnected with fey beings as well mm. isn't like the potency of the land the potency of of your own emotions yeah and we're surrounded by hawthorn trees at mm. the moment that have got these all their little buds are on them we, yeah. we walk up to one in a moment, but they're all sort of pink and ready to go pop, mm. aren't they? Pop yeah. open. So it's that. It's lovely. Yeah. Because we've you know, picked a perfect day for it, really, because it's 
it's really showing the land and all its beauty, isn't it? Here, mm. it's just idyllic. Yeah, shall we walk on? Thank you, Joe. So hawthorns. We've yeah, we're yeah. so admiring that hawthorn. I've I've got a hawthorn in the garden. I only put it in the ground a couple of years ago, but I bought it at Marion Green's Quest Conference in 2016. It was the there. Yeah. And um, somebody was selling little baby hawthorns in pots. Oh wow! And they'd made. They've made various bits and pieces from wood as well, and I think I bought maybe a, an incense burner kind of thing to pop your incense burner, your um, joysticks in. Mm -hmm. And um, so I bought this little hawthorn. I've been caring for it because we were renting at the time, and then when we, you know, we were able to buy our own home, mm. um, I waited for a year or so to see where it seemed happiest in its pot. Yes. And then I planted it, so now it's thriving. But the only thing is, it's never it's never blossomed. Oh. And I had someone to come and give us advice recently, and they said, um, I need to get another one planted mm. somewhere nearby, one that is blossoming. Right. Yeah, so, um, That's like um, apple trees, isn't it? And other fruit trees, they need... Yeah. Some of them need um the male and the female. Yeah. Yeah. Or a uh, complementary species, right? So the, the apple tree that I've got in the garden is I think it's golden delicious. Oh yeah. And I should have bought the I think it's the red delicious or another it's like a tree that complements it that mm. so they they get pollinated. Yeah. So have you? No, I need to get one. I need to. I got that one from Tesco's. Oh, brilliant! <laughs> wow. It yeah. Like a nice tree. Yeah. Sweet little tree. There's, there's. We, when we moved into our place, there's um, an apple tree and a pear tree in the garden. Yeah. Um, and but the apple tree is really. It's been grafted. Oh yeah. And um, um, the same person that was giving us some advice told us it's, it's been done kind of in a really strange way. But what happens is one half of the tree is produces golden delicious type, mm. and then the other produces more of a kind of cox, oh, which yeah. is gorgeous. The coxes are gorgeous. But this year, for some, it's always produced loads of apples. The tree, mm. um, some cox, some golden delicious, which she said is not supposed to happen. She said. What's supposed to happen is that the apple will have some, you know, aspects of the of each of the different kinds of apples within one apple. Yeah. But anyway, so this year, the back of the tree grew a load of golden delicious and the front of the tree just grew one single apple. Just oh. one. Oh. It's really strange. So, um, I don't know what's going to happen this year. And the pear, it, um... It just never, apart from the year that we bought the house um, in 2016, it produced pears, but had not produced any pears until last year when it produced loads. And yet, the apple tree just that was the same year the apple tree just produced one apple. So I don't know what's going on, whether it's mm, I wonder if it's to do with the, the climate and plants. I know. With bluebells on Dartmoor. Bluebells are such little, quite fragile flowers. And and last year we had a really quite dry, cold winter. Mm. Um, so the bluebells they used to come out the first week of May or that. They didn't come to the end of May. I don't think they had enough. Oh, I don't think they had enough um, moisture in the ground oh, yeah. and, and warmth as well yeah. to, to get them off to a good start. We've had bluebells already in 
Bristol. Well, I believe that's a You know, they, they always come later up here. I don't yeah. know. I think that's the rock I was thinking of up there. Oh, yeah. Got to that one. We wandered up the hill and found a lovely large flat rock to lie in the sun and have a rest and it was here that we had a really interesting experience. After our time resting on the rock we went to Emsworthy and explored the old farm ruins there and had a bit more of a chat. Um, that's the barn I was talking about that you can walk down to and lots of like photographers this is photographer paradise when the bluebells come out because they come and take photos of the bluebells with the barn in the background yeah oh yeah I think it's really beautiful yeah it's been deserted for about 200 years, this farm. You can see that ponies use it and it's probably been for the, the cows and, and the horses and stuff. Just exploring the ruined farmhouse at Emsworthy. It's climbing over the wall. <laughs> I think this, yeah, this is just all barn. I don't know whether they house different things, different animals on each side or... Yeah. I love that little window when you look through there and you can see the landscape. There was one from the other side that was blocked up. Ah, uh, perhaps save. One here, is that one? Not from the other side, it looked like one being blocked up. Oh, I don't know. I mean, yeah. They're obviously taking care of it because that one looks quite yeah. Good, yeah. So they've patched it up. Oh, it's so romantic, isn't it? It's I mean, lovely. It's like, you know, with this on a sunny day like today. Yeah. It's um. It is very enchanting and magical. I can imagine. Should we sit here? Yeah, okay. Sit Comfortable seats. Yeah. It was at this point in the recording that I noticed I'd captured a very intriguing EVP or electronic voice phenomena of a woman singing in the background. I've enhanced these recordings so that you can hear them more clearly and I've put one of the recordings on repeat which is the clearest so you can have a chance to listen to the humming in the background. Comfortable seats. Comfortable seats. I always get a bit creeped out with this barn. Okay. That's my feeling. Okay. <laughs> I don't usually go in that side. Right. I don't know whether that's just because it's dark or whether it's just got a feeling of foreboding. I don't know. But this area feels nice. Feels yeah, it does, really, doesn't um, it? What would have been the house? Yeah. What an amazing place to live. Mm. Over there there's, there's like another little enclosure with four trees in it. Okay. We'll go over to you in a minute. We've had a pause, haven't we, but mm. where we were near Widdicombe just now. Yeah. Just noticing some synchronicities that have happened yeah. today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was interesting where we walked to that slab rock. 
Mm. And it felt nice to, because it's such a lovely sunny day today, it felt nice to lie down on that, didn't it? We, we yeah. both sat down and then we both, after a, after a while, felt we'd like to lie down on it. Yes. Lying in the sun, the sun's rays beating down on our faces and we were just sort of talking about how it reminds us of as, um, of being children and and doing that as a child when you're yeah. talking about looking at the cloud formations and and you mentioned faces and I said well I wasn't really thinking about anything and I wasn't really meditating either but a face when I was had my eyes closed and I was just sort of yeah resting this face came through mm. and um and, and I described the face to you yeah. And then next moment we had a visitor which was a passerby. Yes. Whom you recognised. Yeah. And so we had a good chat with him, didn't we? Yeah, but yeah. his face looked like the you know, exactly the like, face that I'd seen what while resting. Seen? So that was quite interesting. Yeah. And and we were saying I mean I know I'm local here. But we'd seen someone in that I knew in Widdicombe as well, in the because um, we went to the cafe, didn't we, before mm. we set out. Um, a person that I knew that recognised me there. And then there we were, like, in the middle of the moor, on a rock, and there's someone else <laughs> <laughs> that I recognise. Mm. That, you know, was was the man that you'd seen in your mind or in your um, visualised? Yeah, about five or ten minutes before. Or yeah, something. yeah. And he said we were talking about sounds, weren't we? Because I was. That's right. I was talking about the experience I'd had. Maybe I should record that actually. The experience I'd had with my son, where we were. It was last. I think it was last autumn, September. We were in that part of the moor, and we were stood by a rock. And my son said that he could hear music, and he's like a teenager. If I talk about fairies or mystical things these days, that you know my children aren't really on board with it or interested. Like yeah, you know, getting more and more sort of sceptical I suppose mm. <laughs> that sort of thing he said I can hear music and uh, Widdicombe's so far away and it's quite a still day it wasn't as windy as today um, and I listened and listened and I just could hear on the periphery of my hearing this music fluty music and um yeah, so that was interesting because we couldn't really pinpoint where it was coming from. And then, whilst we were at that rock just now, that person that I knew came to us and he said, I can smell perfume. Mm. And, well, you're not wearing strong perfume, are no, you? No, no. He said it, but, but it was coming through the wind, wasn't it? And yeah. the wind was actually blowing towards us, so it would have been coming from further up the hill anyway, do you think? Yes. But, yeah, I... I'm not wearing perfume. I'm wearing my lip balm, which I made. Um, I'm going to show off a bit now. I made mm. lip balm from oh. the um, dandelions in our garden. I made some dandelion oil, oil oh, and amazing. then used it to make lip balm. And I put a few drops of orange and rosemary oil in there. Mm. But, I mean, it's practice. it would have rubbed off a long time ago. Um, but yeah, he mm. said he could smell something, mm. some kind of perfume. So yeah, because this, he he did say that. Oh, my s sense of smell isn't that great. Yeah, didn't he? But I could smell this perfume, and yeah, all I could smell was the charred, the charred smell of the, the burnt um, from the swaling, the burnt gorse and bracken that was just a few feet from us. But he said, no, it wasn't that. It was some kind of perfume. Yes. So then <laughs> <laughs> I said, isn't that interesting that these senses are being aroused? Mm. The, the sense of smell, the sense of 
well the the, um, the sounds that you heard yeah. with your son yeah yeah so something connecting into yeah these senses in these places and I I wonder if it is do you think that it's connected with the type of landscape we're in or whether it's a state of just you know it's dependent on your state of mind or a combination of both things yeah I think maybe uh, both yeah I think maybe both the landscape is there and how do we enter into it and if we do then connect with it what what how does that manifest and how do we experience it mm. and maybe it's through a perfume and you know maybe it evokes memories and um and and could it be that it can connect to sound as well there's the story that's in that chapter as well that mark and i wrote about the chagford pixies yes sort of, oh, yes yeah, yeah. um yeah. i think it's mm-hmm. a guy a man driving along and could hear the pixie music mm-hmm. um yeah, I think if you slow down and connect with the landscape, then those edges of our senses, mm. something about the landscape can evoke something within our senses, maybe. Mm. Yeah, because we've just been relaxing. Mm. Yeah, sort of that's just, true. Just to lie on that rock, won't we? Yeah. And feel the warmth of the sun you're in deep relax mode and I could have I could have gone to sleep yeah. to be honest I yeah. could have quite <laughs> no I can definitely a see how you could <laughs> in, in uh, these places how you could just you know head mm. off basically be you know <laughs> mm. get taken away in terms of leaving the external and going inward mm. is very it's very easy in these places. Yeah. It really is. Yes. And and I what's amazing I was talking to my daughter about this yesterday when we were going for a walk. I said, Did you notice, you know, one minute we're on Dartmoor with this because I asked her what she felt and she said just peace. Mm. And then within twenty minutes we're back on the road to where we live and it's busy roads and traffic and houses and complete contrast so it does seem that allowing ourselves some space you know and and this this wonderful um, protected space that we're in on Dartmoor but we need to we were talking about protecting green spaces weren't we and you were saying about your your home and yeah um, how the landscape around you yeah. has been changing uh, definitely yeah definitely and um, you know I know there's people that live near me that really need that green space they mm. really need that green space to be close because not everybody can get in a car and come here like we've been able to do today I mean mm. it's just so important everybody needs it It's this is what we're made of this is where we're from we're part of the landscape and you know it's not it doesn't feel natural to me to be just living surrounded by concrete all the time and, and being in this busy busy world that we, we are in mm. but to be able to drop into these other worlds by coming to these kind of places I mean so much benefit I feel like it's equivalent to a week's holiday somewhere you know just coming and walking here for the day and Mm. it's Mm -hmm. so nice that you got your daughter uh, into the awareness of that as well that she just felt peace I think that that's so important and also thinking Mm. about the way that green space is changing and I know I've mentioned about the buzzard in the garden yes I spoke to a woman the other night who's in Canada. Mm -hmm. I think she's near Ontario. And she was saying that um, there's been a great migration of animals at this time as well uh, Mm. because their habitat is being taken, built upon. Mm. So we've got this situation at this time where lots of people are moving. They're feeling the need to get back to 
the green as we've just had a chat with that passerby and he was mentioning mm. it as well there's just so many people moving to these areas to be close to nature now that they don't necessarily have to be physically where their work is in the city um, but also the you know the creatures of the land um, and air are, and water maybe I don't know mm. are having to move as well because their habitat is being destroyed by Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I notice that more and more. There's more and more um, animals that've been hit by traffic on the roads. Oh um, back in that was back in the autumn. Yeah, back in the autumn, I was driving and I saw a, a fox in the road that'd been hit by a car, sadly. And I couldn't leave it there, you know, it was all the traffic mm. charging by. I thought, I cannot leave this beautiful animal mm. in the road. Um, so I I went back, I got, I got a shovel actually from my house, and with the mind to get it out the road yeah. and just, you know, put it on the verge. So I did that. Yeah. Gosh, it was, it risked my life really, but. I ended up having to pull, pull the poor old thing. I couldn't lift it, it was too heavy. Yeah. Pull it off the road. Me. Yeah. Oh. And just laid laid her to rest under a, a hedge. Yeah. I thought, well, at least she's out of the she's back where she belongs. Yeah. And she was she was obviously had been passing through the field thinking, oh who knows, she might have been wanting to feed her little ones out foraging. Um, but then this, you know, this crazy road is in her path. Um, so, yeah, there's so many sad. those natural pathways yeah. for for creatures that are being disrupted. Yeah, they are. That's yeah. The green corridors are so important. Mm. Um, the issue we've got near where we live is that. Um, a developer has found a tiny piece of land that was sold with a covenant and he's trying to build on it anyway it was mm. sold with a covenant not to be built on but if he blocks that off it blocks the green spaces that link um, that space with all of our gardens and oh. you know already mm. it has really impacted the wildlife because he's mm. um, he's bulldozed the land and it's just so heartless and as mm. you say with people going past in their cars with, well maybe they're just busy and they don't have time to stop but there's lots yeah. of people who would not you know care in the way that, that you did to, to honour mm. this beautiful creature um, and lay it somewhere with respect mm. that you can't just pretend you haven't seen it and move on that well, you, no, you have to do something I thought well if that was a domestic cat or a yeah. dog people would be like oh, horrified yeah. but it's this beautiful dog like creature yeah <laughs> you know and it's got obviously as much worth as any of our domestic pets mm. um, that we love and care for so found a comfy place to sit surrounded by beautiful old tumble down wall um, that's part of the old farm. I was just wondering whether you could tell me a bit about your dad and whether you whether you feel that your connection with fairies comes through that Irish side of your family or yeah. if there's anything that you think is connected with that? I, I think him. definitely there must be. Um, dad was a really amazing person actually he was he was um he passed away 2014 just as we moved to bristol so that was that was uh something that none of us were expecting and um yeah so that was very sad and but i, I kind of feel like he came with me for, mm. for the adventure um so he he came to jersey in 1960 uh, sorry, 1959. So before that, he was living in Ireland and he was from Medfield. Mm -hmm. So Hickey, our surname, 
um, it's an anglicised version of Ohishida, or as we used to pronounce it before we realised we were pronouncing it wrong, oh, Ohikeda. It looks like Ohikeda, um, but it's pronounced Ohishida, and um, it means healer. Um, when I went to Bristol to do my masters, I ended up having a chat with one of the professors. Oh my goodness, I can't remember his surname. His his first name is Brendan, and that is all I can remember. But anyway, he, I had a chat with him one day, and he said, "Actually, your surname's really interesting because it's one of only three surnames that denote professions in Ireland." Because wow. in the UK, you know, you've got Smith, you've got yeah. You've got all, you know, those kind of names that denote what mm. your ancestry, where your ancestry might have came, come from. Mm -hmm. um, in Ireland, that's not common at all. Right. So Hickey being healer, the idea is that they were doctors. Um, and But I think, I think they were, well, apparently we were the, the doctors to the kings of Munster. Right. So of course, cork is part oh, of Munster. Okay. But I think we knew our herbs, <laughs> ah, and that uh, maybe we knew a thing or two about healing. Well, as I say, hickey means healer. So rather than thinking of it in the way that we see doctors today, hmm. I like the idea that we maybe knew remedies and hmm. a thing or two about wellness. Because I do work as a healer now as well. I, I, I do healing appointments and I've always been drawn to that. Mm. So, Dad, um, you know, we, we don't know enough about our ancestry. We really, really should know more. Um, and I look forward to a time when I have the opportunity to research that a bit better. But Dad used to always tell me stories when I would be going up to bed um, when I was a, a small child and he always had a great story he was a fabulous storyteller and it's nice I spoke to a woman recently who used to be the Irish consul in Jersey her name's Pam O'Neill she's a really wonderful lady very, very interesting lady and she said to me oh well your dad you know we miss him he was he was a real fabulous storyteller and he was. Mm -hmm. um, so when I went to bed at night, he would tell me about when he was a kid and what he used to do. And they used to play with a, a stick and hoop. Mm -hmm. He lived mm -hmm. in Mayfield at the time, was quite rural right. in Cork, yeah. Mayfield and Cork. And, um, you know, they didn't have anything really. They were a family of nine, I say nine, nine kids. Um, that was four girls and five boys. And uh, then their, their parents, and, you know, they, they didn't really have much, but he would go roaming around because mm. he was born in 1936. So go roaming around and have adventures uh, but they were always told to beware of the fairy rings oh yeah. yeah and so he would tell me stories about being a child and and you know that child might go out with their mm. friends and they were playing and they would be being led by adventure as children are um, but then it would start to be getting dark and they would suddenly realise maybe they'd lost their friends or maybe they'd lost their way and they weren't quite sure how to get home or which way was the right way home and then they would happen upon fairy ring and the way he described the fairy rings was that they were a dark patch of grass, a darker patch than the surrounding grass mm. and uh, he and it would be of course next to a, a dolmen, a fairy fort mm. it would be in a fairy fort mm. And they, of course, were warned about going near fairy forts because the threat was real. You know, you mm -hmm. don't mess with the fairies. Mm -hmm. But his curiosity or the child in the story's curiosity would draw them in and they would, you know, sit down in this ring and they would 
feel the earth sort of spinning in a way and they would much like you do with meditation actually I still find that now especially in certain places if I yes. go to Stanton Drew I feel the land really spinning yeah and it yeah. is quite disorientating when I go to meditate mm-hmm. um so he you know he described how then they would go off on these adventures they go into fairyland and the characters that they would meet there and they would come back with some kind of knowledge or wisdom or sense of uh, awakening of some sort mm. into bringing it back into the external world with them and they would then be able to find their way home and you know there weren't ever any really scary stories <laughs> wow yeah what an amazing childhood I know yeah he's yeah it, it really was and I, I, I think I thought that everyone's parents told them stories like that at bedtime yeah. and it wasn't until I was older that I realised how lucky I was and even for my older brother and sister I mean I think because there's a big gap between my older brothers and sisters there's a 10 year gap between me and my brother then mm. 12 between me and my sister and 14 then my eldest brother so but by the time mum and dad had me um, I guess they had a little bit more time. Maybe life wasn't quite so stressful. Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I definitely was very lucky to have that that time where he was there. He probably wasn't... He was probably at work when my, my siblings yes. were little. Yeah. But by the time it came to me, he was there and he was the one that was putting me to bed and telling me these stories. I've tried to find out who it was that he learned these stories from. And at some point I learned, because I thought he'd made them up, but at some point I learned that these stories have been passed down through the generations. Right. So oh. I'm not sure how old these sort of stories are and what, you know whether there are elements that have been passed down and how much of it was his own experience out there um, in the countryside and his own imagination. Um he did have some really intense experiences but not fairy related Mm. Um, I know that some quite interesting things happened but I wouldn't relate them to fairy but they were Mm. definitely mystical so Mm. that is something that runs Mm. through my blood Mm. I would would Mm. hazard a guess Um, I yeah I, I yeah like I say I I do want to know more. I mean, I think I spoke to my uncle about this again recently, just before he he passed away very recently, which was a real sad loss. He's the last of the boys, and there's only one of the girls left now as well, my auntie. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, Yeah. and um, so I said to him, would it have been my grandmother? Because I never really met her. She, you know, my, my... my grandfather was born in 1888 and I'm not sure when my grandmother was born but she was about I think she was nearly 20 years younger than him actually mm-hmm. she was quite a bit younger than him um, but my uncle said no it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been your grandmother but we're not sure we're not sure where these stories came from but um, you know hopefully someday I might find a clue to that Yes, I hope you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I do tell these stories to my children, and my oh. little one now, <coughs> she, she always wants a story before she goes to sleep. So oh, it's not wonderful. I'm it's passing such, them on. <laughs> such a legacy, isn't it? We, you know, to, to pass those stories on to you is giving you such a gift. Isn't yeah, it? it really is. Yeah. It's just the the gift of seeing the world in a different way, and yes, that it's okay to do that. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, it's hard, isn't it? Because there's a fine line, you know, between your children waking up in the night and saying that they've seen something and they're frightened, and you saying it's just your imagination. It's a very innocent thing to say, and it's what we do because we want our children to not feel scared. But at the same time you know is there some is there something more we could be doing there is there something more we could be doing to encourage the imagination and mm. to allow them to experience the what i would call pokey or the extraordinary or the mystical without 
just saying it's okay, it's not real, or, yeah. or, or, or kind of fluffing it up in some way, mm. you know, making it into something that's too, you know, sparkly or fluffy. Yes. Because that's not, that's not the whole of nature. Nature mm. is quite pokey. Nature will chase you out of a field if you're <laughs> in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. And, mm. you know, yeah, I think there's something about, in the same way that we would be guarded walking into uh, a field like that and looking for those dangers and, and being respectful and being, you know, honourable to the environment, we can also do that into the other worlds as well. Yes. That we're careful, that we protect ourselves, that we know our place in terms of that we are visitors there. Mm-hmm. And that we need to, you know, ground ourselves and, uh, yeah, be well walk step step through these thresholds with honor and respect yes definitely yeah that's true and um i was just going to say that with my children i always encouraged their imagination when we were out and about i always listened to them um you know, talk about dreams, talked about any sort of experience they had. I'd, I'd take an interest in it mm. and not be like, oh, don't be silly. Or no. I'd, I'd always listen to them. And I'm hoping because of that, because the time to, to do this with children is really when, before they go to school, yeah. um, and whilst they're in primary school, um, because as soon as they get to secondary school, it's all that kind of peer group stuff that comes in and being cool and streetwise and believing in anything that's not um, mainstream isn't cool anymore, is it? Mm-hmm. Unless, you know, unless they're sort of determined, they've got that in themselves, determined to hold on to it. And but it's a hard thing to do, isn't it, yeah. when you're in that situation? So I think just by encouraging that from a young age, then at least they've got some foundation to go back to later in life if they want to, haven't they? Like, yeah. oh, oh, I remember mum saying that. And, oh, yeah, that makes sense now. Yeah. yeah. Because it's sad isn't it? It's sad when they start to drift away from that, but on the other hand, I, I'm not going to say to them, well, you should believe in this. <laughs> no, I think we have to do that as well. Yeah. I mean, mm. you know, I oh God, it, you know, I feel kind of heartbroken that, that Dad isn't here mm. now to, to share, you know, all of these times with, because yeah. now I know. You yeah. know, but there was a time, of course, I knew when I was a child, and I was sort of opening, and, and he you know, he he aided um, me or encouraged me, as you say, with you know, being imaginative. But I did grow up and think, oh, that's all nonsense. And, you know, I think I I did want to be, you know, a bit, you, you know, you don't want to step out of line and believe things that your friends don't believe, etc., etc. And I think of all the things he did try to teach me, you know, about birds, he knew every tree, mm. he knew every bird song, he knew things about nature that were so valuable that I think, you know, as as kids, we grow up, we become teenagers, it's a natural thing for us to pull away and be independent and sort of rebel against whatever it is that we've grown up in because we have to yes. form ourselves and in order to do that, mm. we have to sort of step a fair bit away from what we've grown up with mm, yeah. so that then at some point in later life and for me it's maybe even perhaps it's even your 30s and 40s that you then establish who you are and it's somewhere between where you you know what you were brought up with mm. and what you experience yourself yes somehow you you know that you, mm. you do take so much as you say from those early years yeah and that they are foundational absolutely Yes, I, definitely. I, I'm glad that I knew. I'm glad that I knew my grandparents, um, especially my, especially my grandfather and my grandmother on my dad's side. I mean, I loved, I loved my 
my mum's parents as well, but um, they had that connection to Dartmoor. And my, like your dad, my grandfather, my dad's dad, he was such a great storyteller. Um, you know, yeah. and he he was the one that encouraged my interest in the other world because the one story I wanted him to tell whenever we went to see him was the hairy hands okay. because that was his his father that was according to him was involved in that story mm. and he could see me on the edge of my seat while he was telling the story and I remember him coming around to see me and he'd always bring a book and he brought me a series of books that were published by Osborne oh, like children's yeah. books about unexplained things yeah, so <laughs> there's one about UFOs one about witches monsters you know all that kind of thing and I just I would sit behind the sofa or in my bedroom and just read them and like look at the pictures or the illustrations and just be like, oh, so fascinated um, and then I loved I loved Doctor Who, I love Star Trek, you know, I loved all those other worldly things mm. when I was growing up. But it was because he had that, he knew I had that interest and in was one of the family that inc actively encouraged it in that sort of gentle way. That's so nice. Yeah. yeah. That I really appreciated. And, um, and he was fond of nature as well. He you know, keep a little journal yeah. about nature, and my grand. So, it is those sort of elders, isn't it? They're really yeah. key yeah. in a family. The the ones that are the the story keepers. The you know, and I think children are really well, like you and I and other children growing up with elders like that that do convey this wisdom to them and spend time with children. Mm. That is um, such a treasure for the future life. It really is. Yeah. yeah. Did your grand take you on any walks in Dartmoor? He didn't. He was getting on quite a bit when I when I used to go and see him. He lived in Torquay. Um, so no, but he'd talk about growing up or living in, in Princeton and some of the experiences he had. Mm. So yeah, he had his own ghost stories cool. that I'd be like, oh, story. <laughs> it's hard to get an edge, oh, uh, a word in edgeways because he was such a talker. Yeah. He was talk and talk <laughs> and talk and talk. Brilliant. But it was the, I think he must have known that we liked hearing his ghost stories. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he had one where about he and his, he and my grandmother when they in their younger days, crossing Dartmoor, on his motorbike with my gran on the back one moonlit night and he said that this uh, stone from one of these yeah. walls along the side of the road he said it didn't fall off he said it just um, levitated off the top of the wall goodness me yeah and they Brilliant. both saw that and he talked about growing up in Prince Town and the sort of like the back alleys to the houses that they lived because it was prison mm. accommodation and they had these um, like brick the way I described it was like um, these back alleys that were brick lined either mm -hmm. side he and his friends used to run through and he said this white he said it wasn't a sheep but he said it looked like this white kind of apparition went across the alleyway in front of them Spooky. Yeah. It's an interesting vibe up there, isn't it, mm. as well, I found, when we were there. It's, quite... it's very old, and the prison's been there about 300 years or something. I think it's been there since Napoleonic times. Goodness me, wow. Yeah. Yeah, quite, quite an old area. So he had some childhood experiences as well, interesting. Yeah. And, oh, so much I could say about him, but yeah, he's an interesting person. I was just interested in 
where you see the Modern Fairy Sightings project going in the future, um, where you'd like it to go and yeah, any thoughts about how it's going to, how you'd like to see it unfold yeah. going forward? Um, I feel like I'm led by it, if anything, rather than me sort of directing. I feel like always, you know, since the beginning, since I had the idea of doing the podcast um, in early lockdown, yeah. I was doing sort of a daily meditation and um, the idea for the podcast came then, even though I had no experience of doing anything like that, I went with it. Um, and and I've absolutely loved doing this. I, it's, I just feel like it's my life. <laughs> I care as much for this project as I do each of my children you know mm. it's very meaningful to me so the project has always been about allowing a space or, or you know the project allowing space for people to share their own experiences in their own words because mm. I think that that is what was missing a lot of the time you might hear hearsay but to hear somebody describe their own experiences very powerful and it's also very healing for other people to hear that especially if you've had an experience yourself and haven't had anybody to you know to tell about mm. it or talk to about it so to hear that someone else has experienced something like like you have then it's a validation and it's it's a great relief so the project will always center around that the research and writing that's happening at the moment is a chance for me to gather all that's happened over the last couple of years um, and get that straightened out because I've always been sort of busy just producing the episodes um, and to have a chance to also speak to people that do not want to appear on the podcast but just want to tell their story. You know, so that's something that can go in the book then. Um, and also working a bit with video. So I have been speaking to a lot more researchers in, over the last year. And you'll be coming on soon as well. Yes, I'd love to. I'd love to come on your show. I'd yeah. be really honoured. <laughs> yeah, so that that would be, yeah, it'd be brilliant yeah. to have you on. So um, I'm really enjoying that, speaking to researchers, seeing where they are with all of this and you know seeing where we can share information and um those a lot of those interviews have been videoed there is a youtube channel one fairy sightings podcast youtube channel and also i have my patreon group who are a group of absolutely wonderful human beings mm -hmm. um it's a really lovely open-hearted sharing group um mm -hmm. And they support the podcast by just simply being in, in Patreon and, and being themselves and supporting each other as well. So we meet monthly for a Zoom chat and then we have the Discord that runs all the time so people can talk to each other in there. And they also uh, get access to bonus episodes within Patreon. So at the mm. moment we're doing the monthly Modern Fairy Sightings podcasts. In between that, I do a, a bonus for patrons, an exclusive episode for, for them. And I also do a bonus episode relating to the monthly episode. So it might be some more personal parts of the conversation that mm. take place that I feel would really be suitable for people that are kind of really into this rather than just freely available. Again, honouring and respecting mm -hmm. the experiences and the beings involved, not just the people that I'm talking to but the fairy beings that are related to those encounters yes um yeah so but I love what I'm doing I feel like I've found mm -hmm. my groove and, you know it's so meaningful to me and I've always known from the very start that this was something that was very important to to do mm -hmm. and I'm happy to be led and see where it goes really yeah that's wonderful and I, I can really vouch for Joe's um, lovely, lovely patron group because I've followed, I think I found you through Facebook mm. a few years ago and I started following your Facebook group 
um, because of my interest in in fairies. And and then I thought, yeah, I really want to. I really believe in what you're doing. And I thought, yeah, I want to be part of this. This one, you know, what you're creating. And so, thank you. Yeah, I love being part of your patron. And yeah, it's a really lovely group of people, isn't it? That's that come together. We were we were just talking about how this kind of work is so important. We're bringing this um, much needed alternative reality. Um, people the chance to talk about it but really you know I was reading Jack I've got Jack Hunter's book oh, yeah. reading the, the paranormal, paranormal. Yeah. now there's a there's a essay in there that I was reading the other morning I find because my interest in place and supernatural um, and that book is obviously ties into all of that the series of essays and there's an essay in there by a First Nations mm. person and I like what he says in there. He said, there's no such thing as the paranormal. It's all normal. Yeah. And yeah. it's this, maybe one day we'll get rid of that kind of othering mm. these experiences and just put it down to, no, it's normal. And even in going back to the, the pixie accounts that we started talking about at the beginning, there's always this kind of, slightly nudge nudge wink wink mm. oh well they'd been at the pub yeah. they were mad you know mm. yeah. it's, I mean it's sort of thinking about the old pixie stories of course what that does is you know it shuts people up oh yeah. well, they're going to think I was drunk they're going to think I was mad mm. you know it does a very good job at shutting people up well mm. maybe it's time you know this is the time now where we talk about it yeah and uh, and <laughs> those that would, that would prefer us to shut up well yeah you know, that's that's for them to bother about but we've got yeah. some we've got some interesting journeys to embark on to to get back to our real connection with nature again and, yes. and that's more important to me yeah. I feel I do understand people's reluctance to talk in this mm. day and age but I think more and more people are opening up because yes. of the work that you and I and other researchers are doing yeah and yeah people just feeling you know that uh that it's it's uh perhaps with a renewed reconnection to, to nature that it's actually that this is the real world and it's mm. ne- not necessarily the the very busy day-to-day work that we're doing you know going to and from from work and always chasing these work deadlines and the stresses of daily life but actually then when you come out and you take time in these kind of places you realize that this is actually what life is and we are part yeah. of this yeah. naturally mm. naturally we are part of this not the crazy the other crazy stuff no no we're part of nature and this is where our our consciousness grows and thrives doesn't yeah. it this is it's not only physical space it's space for all well, as we've kind of experienced today, the more you relax into it, the more you open up to the environment and the other world mm. and what's going on around you. And, you know, more of us need to give ourselves permission to be in these places or, you know, just spend time out of what what we think is the right thing to do mm. being in busy jobs like you say and mm. I know we all we all have to make a living but it's yeah. just it's just giving that step allowing yourself to step out is such a gift to yourself yeah. isn't it yeah mm. and it can be as as we've sort of talked about before it can just be stepping out into your local park and connecting with a tree you know not not everybody can get to these vast expanse expanses of of um, wilderness or nature but we can do it in a very very simple way mm. I mean even if it would be to, to grow herbs on your windowsill or to go for a walk in your local park or you know 
um, connect with whatever it is that you have around you because even in a small way mm. you can get a, you know you can get a great deal of peace and connection from from that mm. from even just that but yeah. I have to say I mean oh look we've been joined by a friend let's have a look oh just turn around oh oh it's a beautiful pony behind yeah. us having a nibble so gorgeous. I mean, this is just magnificent what you have here. Oh, yeah, it's, it's really wonderful. Heavenly. I mean, it's such a beautiful part of the world. And I, to be honest, I don't want to live anywhere else. I have dreams of, I have dreams of travelling, obviously. And, but I always want to come back here. Yeah, don't blame you. Um, and obviously what you're doing by taking people on walks here you're bringing this to people and that mm. I, I absolutely love listening to your episodes I take some special time out for myself yeah. to listen to the episodes because I really enjoy them and I feel like you know you do you do bring a sense of that expanse to people through through your episodes oh, oh, yeah, thank you I, was thank so you. I appreciate that that's yeah I mean Walking is so special to me. This landscape and and other places in nature, there's other special places, is really important to me. And um, yeah, if I can bring it to, bring it to people uh, through through you know listening or you know as well as visual ways, then, yeah, I just feel like I'm. Like you say, it's this passion to want to connect people to to place, and just to realise that there's much more going on than just um, a few trees and <laughs> a few rocks. <laughs> there's so much more to offer, not on offer to people. Hello, welcome back. Thank you for listening to the end of the episode. It's so wonderful how our senses can be aroused in these liminal landscapes, especially if we slow down, relax and go into a meditative state. I feel the experiences Joe and I had were because we were relaxed and in a mindful state of mind and because we were on a similar vibration, being like-minded souls, both sensitive to the supernatural and invested in exploring these experiences. Remember to step through these special thresholds with honour and respect. It's so important to do so and to see these special places in this way. Some thoughts about the woman that I heard singing or humming a wordless song. It's not the first time that I'd heard this woman. From January 2022, I'd heard a woman singing around the time of my birthday. Then, later in January, I wandered with a guest called Tiffane Dargon on Dartmoor and she brought her flute with her. Um, this is an episode that I will replay later in season two. After Tiff had finished playing her flute, I heard a woman singing in the background coming from the woods that point I didn't have my recorder on and then during this recording with Joe, a few months later I captured the woman humming. I feel the woman could be a guardian spirit, perhaps one of my ancestors. Thank you for listening to this very special episode. If you're a carer like me remember to take some time out for yourself either relaxing, enjoying a hobby, or connecting with friends, beloveds, and nature. See you next time, and remember to keep your heart open and be the change.